and uh, we just want to do a couple of quick updates and uh, and then we'll get to tonight's program and the first one is on the annex building and rich if you could show the pictures the building is essentially complete and uh, with great thanks to Dave Carl. Uh, he did a, a lot of the coordination and uh, to Eric Diem and Joe Supa, it's just a great job. And if we can, uh, we had to do a outdoor ramp and there's the inside. Now, Dave, if we, um, I think on the other side where Dave's facing, is, there's a desk now a and um, at some point in the springtime, I'm sure that John and Linda LaPierre will uh, be filling that building up. So that's where we are with the new building. And uh, with the upside down house, um, we did get it decorated for Christmas. We look sort of like bandits out there with our masks on. And uh, we're gonna de-decorate today at, um, or we're gonna de-decorate de this week Wednesday at 11 o'clock. So if anybody is interested in de-decorating, uh, just meet us at the Upside Down House at 11 o'clock. And um, for membership renewals and donations, John wanted to let everybody know that, uh, first of all, welcome to our newest members. And he expresses his gratitude towards those who have recently made donations and re renewed their memberships. We couldn't do what we do without the continued support of all the membership. And there've been some really nice donations come in this uh, Christmas season. It's been great. So thank you all. And then the last thing we have is Janet Carl brought to our attention that we have two places that the society is set to, um, to keep the highway clean, the adopt a highway. And we haven't done our sections in quite some time. And Janet has graciously agreed to coordinate the, um, the highway, uh, highway cleanup day. And um, I'm sure she'll pick a day that it's not snowing, which seems like most of the days, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so if you're interested in helping, just go ahead and email Janet at carljanet at gmail.com. And that is all of our announcements for right now. After we're after Randy's talk, we'll talk about next month's meeting. But uh, we're going to get right into our program presented by longtime Mono Basin resident Randy Debaye. And it, the talk is Water Stories of the Mono Basin, True or False? So we're ready to go to Randy. Thank you for the introduction, Robin. Um, there's. Uh been through quite a few uh, parts of this uh, talk have been changed quite a bit. That's the screensaver. And uh, well, first I wanna thank my wife, Susan, and my daughter, Molly, for helping me. This wouldn't have come together at all without their help. So, the watershed inside the blue, all the snow and water and rain that come into Mono Lake start at that rim. And that's so from the going towards the center that of the blue line is downhill. And the gold line is the Ice Age shoreline, which was obviously a long time ago. So we are going to start in Levine and Canyon. We are going to then go through the town of Levining and immediately start on the westerly shore of the lake and go up to Conway Summit, right about where the Ice Age shoreline dot is. And that will be the most confusing part. So try to pay attention when I get to Conway Summit. And then we're gonna come back down and go parallel to the pole line road, which is the long straight line, California 167. And we're gonna go to the north of that. And we're gonna go all the way out to the mountain, which looks like an island in yellow. And then we're gonna just spend two or three locations to the southerly, southeasterly part 
of the pole line road way out miles and miles from the lake and then come back to DeChambeau Ranch and then back to Lee Vining. So looks like a title page. Um, the Pelton wheel is the key to all hydroelectric and that is turned by water. Uh, as idea of the scale of that wheel, which is up at the head of Levine and Canyon, staying down low. Uh, the hood of my Subaru is down in the foreground and that is about six feet tall. It's very tall. And imagine two really big pie tins that cover that and bolt together all the way around the diameter and the water coming in from the lake or reservoir or penstock or creek and exiting, it comes in high and exits low. And that centerpiece is about three and a half inch thick steel. Next, <coughs> we go down the canyon a ways. Levining water system, uh, water manager's dream. It's gravity fed from about three miles up the canyon, comes down to very close to 395 and goes on to the town of Levining. I am uh, here, I am parked at the exit of the Forest Service Visitor Center access road, looking southeasterly and an entire area, mostly the gray sage brush, obviously, but a little bit up on the hill at one time was planted in alfalfa. I uh, had a chance to see a photograph at a paper show in San Francisco that was kind of pricey. I wish that I would have got it, but it had been all planted in alfalfa when Levining didn't look much like it does now. Now we've gone north of Levining to Tioga Lodge, Post Office Creek comes down off of the high bench up where Log Cabin Mine is. And my back, I'm turning around and walking across the highway and looking at the outflow where Post Office Creek flows into the lake, the little willow trees along the left there are roughly the water course. And historically, the big thing that happened here was a flash flood and a gas station and some automobiles, I don't know how many, washed into the lake and they were never recovered. And that story came from Jack Preston, who was uh, a long time resident of Mono Lake, lived here most of his life for 83 years. So this is, uh, just one of the few maps that we put in. This is right about where we are with the red arrow and we're gonna continue on in a straightish line up towards Conway Summit. We're still very close to Tioga Lodge. This is uh, the rule cabin, which is formerly known as, um, I knew it when I first moved here as uh, Pat and Ernie Pinier's residence. They lived there for I think 35 years. And uh, one of the highlights that Ernie, I asked him if he ever saw mountain lions there long, 10 years after he moved from there. And he said, we saw 11 at one time in the backyard, which the main house has been taken down. A lot of water, just a lot of water on that property in Springs, enough to where they had a uh, irrigation ditch that went back south to the Tioga Lodge. And Moving a little further northish on 395, this is, uh, I always called it uh, Mono Lake Edison Station. Uh, Google Earth calls it McPherson Subdivision Road. And uh, there, for many years, there was a little three quarter inch pipe coming out right there by that stake. That stake has got some uh, increments on it in inches, I think. And across where the, where the grass and the bushes change color, right, diagonally through from right to left is a ditch that collects water from uh, the hillside for probably 250 feet. And then uh, right behind that is a little area of Mono Basin that is very undisturbed. It's all, you could drive right by it on the highway. We're right across from the shrimp plant. 
This is Nellie Bly O'Brien's right side up house. She, uh, history, for those of you who don't know, she created uh, Tioga uh, Correction, Lundy Lake Resort. She had this uh, winter place down uh, on the McPherson property, and that was a little museum. She probably slept there. The upside down house was to the rear and to the right, about 50 feet from this house. And there is a lot of water there. Again, there's 250 feet where the water just comes down. It's, it goes into culverts and gets across the highway in one or two places. And now we are at the parking lot of the Mono Inn, just another quarter of a mile down the road. And this is the power plant. And I lived on the Mono Inn property for about three years. Susan lived there. We never went in this place. We just some place that we had no business to be in. But a few years ago, um, Harvey Lewis of June Lake uh, got permission to repair it. He didn't have to restore it. And this is inside uh, the Pelton wheel. We'll get another picture. That's inside that little shed, water coming in and water going out, going out the white pipe. So this is a 10 inch correction, 12 inch Pelton wheel. The first of the donut looking things behind the pulley in the center of the picture. And the second thing that uh, is electric motor and there's a shaft that connects them. The pipe on the right is water coming in. You cannot see the water coming out. I think it comes out the bottom low on the right, comes around and goes up that white pipe and out to a couple of cisterns, which you've seen better years and they were used for irrigation water and drinking water for the Mona Wind for many, many years. And they irrigate the big row of trees behind the Mono Inn and go down to the houses down below that Jack Preston planted when he was a lot younger than 93. So here we are, the red circle. We're going now to the old schoolhouse property where the main building of our museum sat for many years. Um, I can't think of the name of the folks that lived there, but it was a residence when I was here. It belonged to Caltrans for many years. And this is looking up towards the Sierra, and that's right off the highway. We're, we're only 120 feet from US 395. And now we're about 220 feet from US 395, maybe 300. And we're right up that where that last picture showed where the old highway, which is now maybe old schoolhouse road uh, was crossed by the old highway. Just a tiny bit further up, we're looking way up in the water course coming down the canyon there is Upper DeChambeau Creek and to the base off to the left are two uh, large springs. One was the water supply for Mono Inn, which also supplied that little water wheel that we saw. And the lower one uh, supplied water to uh, the Jan Simus property. And that the trees to the right, lower right of center are the Jan Simus property. Now we've gone up the uh, old schoolhouse road to right at Lundy Creek and the bridge to Lundy Creek is in the background, upper center. And that spring has been there for 50 years, coming right out of the pavement. And it's about eight feet above the level of the creek. I always thought it had something to do with the creek, but it can't. And a couple more pictures of, of that spring running down. It's, it's flowed into the asphalt over the many, many years. And that's, that's the heart of the spring where the water comes right up. Now we've crossed Lundy Canyon and we're right at the foot of the uh, fire services building on, on Lundy Canyon, fairly new building, 10 years maybe. And I have tried to avoid the channels and irrigation ditches because they're, I don't know, 
I don't know what they do. I think I do, but so this water is going towards Conway Ranch. You can see Conway Summit in the foreground and the way in the left, high up almost to the sky, you see a big patch of aspens and that's, we will visit that site soon. And um, this water was changed by, I think, Mono County. And you can see the white plastic in there making it, uh, making it pretty fresh. So we've gone around the um, moraine now and we are standing in the parking lot of Mill Creek Power Plant, which lots of name changes in the time that I've been here. And now it might be something else which we'll show. Right almost at the bottom of that thing, I hope you can make it large if you can't see it, there is a pipe. That's the pent stock, pent up water coming out of Lundy Lake, which provides the drop or it's called head in the water business to turn the Pelton wheels inside Lundy Lake hydraulic project. So this is uh, Mill Creek power plant, Lundy Lake geothermal. So the uh, exit, the water comes in from the right, goes out to the left. There's a major ditch, just, just this side of those uh, all the iron work there with some transistors in it. And right behind uh, Jordan power plant is to the left uh, about a quarter of a mile. This is the very end of the road that goes up to the replacement for the Jordan power plant, the Jordan power plant site. Thank you, Chris. So to my back in the last photograph, there is a large meadow with lots of irrigation in it. And it's probably a mile north to south. At the far end of that, I'm going up towards Jordan Spring, which is, I pointed out a little bit ago. And I got to this water and I thought, this has got to have a name. This has got to have a name. And I went to the topographical maps and I couldn't, couldn't find a name. All it had were all these little sites for prospects. And tonight when I was going through it, I was on Google Earth and I see a little blue line and I follow that blue line to the west. And the name of that water course is Wilson Creek, which really surprised me. I didn't know there was any Wilson Creek above Conway Ranch, but that's it. And if you ever want to entertain yourself on a cold winter night, you go all... Google Earth, which we have some of a little bit later, shows lots of amazing things. This is Jordan Springs and Conway Summit is a, it's not a mile. Uh, the overlook is just about the center over the top of that. There's quite a bit of water there. It's got to beat the bushes to go through there. Um, that's northwesterly of that Wilson Creek. This is Jordan Spring in the background on the left. This is Jordan Cemetery in the foreground, which is where the uh, people that died in the 1921, don't quote me, uh, avalanche at Jordan Power Plant. And I think one woman survived with her puppy. And uh, Augie Hess talked about going there. He was probably 17 or 18 about that rescue. and. He said it was a big deal. Lots of healthy people gave all they had to get in there to see, see what they could salvage. So now, if you're nodding off, wake up, pay attention, please. This was the start of this whole talk. I was gonna talk about a water flume that crossed over Conway Summit from bringing Virginia Creek water into Mono Basin, which is not a natural flow of things. This culvert, which is, you can see in the background on the left, uh, the, the tr transmission powers for uh, mostly uh, radio and, and um, communication. And this is the Old Summit restaurants, right dead center in the middle of the thing. This is a property owned by John and uh, Carolyn 
from the Virginia Lakes Resort. And 180 degrees from this, now that is going right towards Mono Lake. From there, this is right at this top where the water goes one way or the other to the Bridgeport Reservoir drainage or to Mono Basin. And immediately behind that, I turned around, walked across the street. Here is the ditch coming in from Virginia Creek. And now we're looking full west. Now we're up Virginia Lakes Road, not a mile, three quarters of a mile. This is Virginia Creek. The water collection box on the right fills the two ditches that we just saw. And the arrow is pointing to a valve that fills the pipe that it, rather, it travels through a pipe for a while and then goes into that ditch. And here's the bridge. That's an old, obviously an old highway, apparently an old highway, very substantial bridge, still, still solid. And Virginia Creek runs right over that. And this is a kind of a bootleg little camping spot down there that's very nice. You're just a mile off of 395. This is an original drawing, 1859. That's just 10 years. The gold was only been discovered for 10 years and there were miners in Mono Basin and they needed water. This is uh, looking south at that bridge. Right dead center of the picture is uh, a dimension which I could not figure it, but it's a lot, a lot of feet. Maybe 300, but I can't believe that. Conway Summit Highway goes right there, right between those uprights. And to the left is the steeper slope that goes through the Caltrans area and goes on up to the uh, communications and to the right. We're going to go up there to the right. And the little sketch down below is an end view with the cross braces on that thing. Don't try to remember all this. Most of this map, which is 1859, is not in the Mono Basin. But I'm fudging because much of the water that this map depicts goes into the Mono Basin. If you go, uh, the, so the big print that we can all read, hopefully, uh, Ridge Between Mono Lake and Virginia Creek. Directly above the word between, there is a horizontal straight line that's longs and lats, but the, the little bend that looks like an elbow, and I'm almost in the center of the photograph, is a ditch that's carrying water from Virginia Creek to a flume, of, which is the draw, sketch we just saw, that is a dotted line directly above the word mono, where there's a bunch of verbiage in there. There's a little dotted yellow line. When that dotted yellow line starts, that is the flume, the aerial water conduit that goes all the way across the gap. If you go right above the words lake over to the right, there are two ditches, and those ditches go north towards Bridgeport. And I don't know how far they went, where they were supposed to go. Somebody said, oh, they go all the way around the mountain to Mono Diggins and dump water in. That's hard to believe. Back to the very center, and this is something I didn't know until doing this research. There is a big, broad red line. And if you go up, follow it to the left, up, 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 there's another elbow up there and that says outlet. And below that in the dark, it says flume. Well, in another photograph I have that's not included in the talk, that red line to the left goes around and all, it goes way up to an cinnamon meadows. That's cinnamon with an S. He was an early pioneer of the Mono Basin. Uh, Bishop will use his name for another place name uh, in a little bit. And uh, Chalfont Valley, Cinna, Mr. Cinnamon, property owner. 
So uh, we could go on, but it would be most a guess. This is a professional mm. drawing of another flume, not the one over Conway. Again, not the one over Conway, but similar construction, doing similar things, moving water across a canyon so that it can be used on the other side. Now I'm up on the on the roads above Conway Summit. I'm on the west southwestern side. The line uh, going left disappearing to the right is US Highway 395. <clears throat> this is in September of this year. So that's less we've got a little smoke there. The arrow points to what remains of that ditch and it's not very far from here where it went across the canyon. So it was long. I mean, it was way long. I don't, and uh, I got those photographs from Carolyn Webb. She used to have some other drawings, Susan and I have both seen, that were really detailed and exquisitely done and they disappeared. So this is just turning a little bit from that last photograph and there is a ditch up very high that the arrow points is very faint. And there's the Caltrans building and the Summit restaurant. And I think they were gonna put another flume up higher and they started that ditch or had some plan to get the water up higher, but it never. <coughs> this is up on the east side of Conway Summit, looking north towards Bridgeport, and that arrow is pointing. There's just a little light, grassy area there, and it's the same grass, I think, uh, rye grass that's shown in the foreground, and that is the high ditch going to the north. I don't think it was ever used, but what do I know? Okay, Ariel, Google Earth, Yahoo. Uh, Conway Summit intersection roads is to the right. The two arrows are pointing to the ditch that brought Virginia Creek water to the flume. And Virginia Creek is the dark green. And you can see that the ditch just stops. And that road where it stops was where I took the photograph, the first photograph of this series. So the reason that I want to go into a lot of detail is John up at the, uh... oh, Yahoo, thank you, William. Thank you, thank you. I need to talk to you. Um, okay, moving along. I'll go back for one second. Follow the end of the upper right arrow and you'll see a little white curly cue of a trail that Google Earth has got on the road. That's where the water from Virginia Creek goes into the ditch and you can see a little road that the pipeline goes down that goes a different place. Those two, those two conduits go different places. One goes to the flume 200 feet in the air and one just goes downhill to Mono Diggins. And the center are the ditches that go to the right and going down in the um, photograph, we're going towards the Conway Summit Vista. And those ditches go around the Vista and you can see them, especially after a snow or in the spring when things are melting, you can see those water conduits. And that was not the flume. The flume was only across Conway Summit. Now we're at the bottom of Conway and the water that came from Virginia Creek in the water collection box that I showed you and that valve dumps into a canyon, which you go over Conway Summit, I came over today southbound and the passenger could just look right down at this canyon that this water goes into and flows into Conway Ranch. And that's right at the, now it's called Conway Road, not Adobe Meadows Roads. Now we've moved all the way through Conway Ranch and up the mountain to uh, Bacon Gulch, which is also called 
cinnamon cut because he cut a road into Bridgeport from Monoville. So Mono Diggins is to the right. Uh, and right under the H around that little berm there is a yellow bead mine, which George Totlin, a man that knew about gold, said was the best mine that he owned. So this is hydraulic tailings. That water that came over the flume was used under pressure. And this is ground hydraulicing as opposed to bank hydraulicing. Now, this is the unnamed rock formation. This is between Monoville and the cinnamon cut. Uh, more tailings right there. If you're coming down Conway Summit and you're just past the Vista Point, this stands right out. It's not on the horizon, but it's down a little bit. Real prominent thing. I, years ago, somebody called it the Chinaman's hat and I kind of got that. More tailings. And this spring is just right at the base. That's, that's just a couple hundred yards from where I took the picture of that mountain. And where you see cottontails, left-hand side of the picture, there's water. And that is a spring. It's kind of hard to get to. It's difficult. You wouldn't want to have to dip your water in it, your water glass in it and take a big drink. It's a little bit murky, a little bit stagnant, but there is water there and the animals do use it. There's a little different shot. Now we're down out of that canyon and you can see Conway, the cut, the big cut, uh, Conway right to center towards the upper part, just more tailings. So they move water. I don't know, they used natural drainages as much as they could, but they moved water from the top of that pass all the way down to here to do some ground hydraulicing. Okay, we've moved away from the Conway Summit. And if I ever do another one of these, it'll be in more detail on that topic because it's a little bit complicated. <coughs> the arrow points to Buffalo Berry. And Buffalo Berry needs water. So if you're a traveler, with your horse and mule and you don't have your little cooler buzzing at your side with ice in it or, and you uh, 100 years ago you would go to that. Hector Station was a stage stop and we are again on the Adobe Meadows Road which may be the Goat Ranch cutoff, it may be the Conway Ranch Road but I know it as the Adobe Meadows Road and these are spurs off the Adobe Meadows Road. And Jack Preston again, who taught me a lot about the basin said, oh, there were all fruit trees out there. Hector grew fruit trees. I said, what kind of fruit trees? He says, all kinds of fruit trees, mostly apple. And I said, how many fruit trees? He said, 200 at least. So that's pretty impressive. Only a hundred years ago, there were 200 apple trees growing there. Okay, we're at the bottom end of Bridgeport, southern end of Bridgeport Canyon, which was the road from Mono Basin for many, many years to Bridgeport. Coyote Springs is up there, uh, which is just the upper, upper limits of the hydraulic, hydrological, maybe that's, that's I'm making up a word. Anyway, the trees, that's uh, Goat Ranch, Scanovino, uh, property, lots and lots of water. And if you Google Earth it, you can't find the water I'm going to tell you about. 300 yards from this point, which is right at the junction of Cottonwood Canyon Road, Adobe Meadows Road, Goat Ranch cut off a whole bunch of them. 300 yards, just over the large tree in the to the center is a sinkhole 12 to 16 feet deep, 12 to 16 feet in diameter with water running in the bottom of it. And you don't get too close because you can fall in as the earth has over many hundreds of years. And some people that know about geology in the basin, and I told them that, they said, no way, no way, no way. I've been all over that place. Well, 
it's way. And if you don't, uh, hopefully you, if you really need to know an eyewitness, Tom Crow lives out in Green Acres, the bottom of Pole Line Road and shows his face in town once in a while, says, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's there. A little bit out of sequence. Uh, oh no, that's right in sequence. That's further along the road. Now we're off. We left Cottonwood Canyon Road that swings around to the left and go up to Bodie. Somebody joining me. Um, that rock house is year round water unless it's really heavy drought. There's almost always water and that is Cottonwood Creek comes out of the one of hundreds of Cottonwood Canyons in this fair state that the Bodie Road follows in from, from the Southeast. And I purposely deleted all the close-ups of residences. I didn't even take them. So we're continuing on along that road, just some springs in there and, and along the base of that hill, there's the gray area, that's, that's grassy area, that's grazing. And that's why Fly and M has property in the Mono Basin for winter grays when they need it. And along that road, now the reason this has something to do with water is because if you look closely, the masonry there is to put together with mortar and mortar needs water. Anyway, that was a siding uh, for the uh, railroad from nowhere to nothing and Bodie to Mono Mills. And they needed the mortar for masonry where it adds the, the stickiness to uh, cement when you're making mortar for rock and brickwork. Now this trench canyon is important because at the other end of it, there's a big lake, not as big as Mono Lake. Um, I'll cover that a little more in the next slide. And right dead center lower, you'll see some white stripes along what may be Dave and I, uh, Dave Carl and I have talked about this, which may be, oh, I can't, the Cedar Hill. And then the two little peaks there are a little landmark so you can orient yourself from lots of places in the basin. Between there, there's the two little peaks again. This was always the windmill to me for many years. Well, the windmill's yard art for somebody now. And uh, those are military surplus. Right in the center, you'll see a series of yellow stripes. That's the outgoing edge of water tanks. And the arrow is pointing to a capped well. And there is water at the bottom of that well, as my grandchildren will attest. I let them each drop one small rock into the well. Now, Trench Canyon, uh, Larkin Lake, which is predominantly dry. It's dry. It's real grassy and real brushy uh, during the summer with, with a brambly grass. No trees, no real bushes, a uh, real thick grass. And uh, John Hennick, who's a neighbor of mine in the summers, uh, said he saw two or 300 seagulls on that lake in the spring of a, of a real wet year. And you can drive through that notch. Uh, you could probably do it in a two wheel drive high center vehicle, but uh, don't take your Tesla through there. <laughs> we have crossed Pole Line Road. Well, I'm not gonna go into the how it got to be Pole Line Road. You can see Boundary Peak in the background. You can also see White Mountain Peak in the background on the left. If you squint, it's still smoky time. Alameda Wells, a uh, property of Flanham Ranch, the large structure on the left was a residence that is no longer habitable. The next structure to the right, which looks like it's just posts, which it is right on the top of the bush that's almost the center. That I believe is the actual well building. And we're gonna visit two more places. We've gone further down the Alameda Wells Correction, Adobe Meadows Road and taken a spur to the east to deep wells. 
and we have an error in the name that shows on very old maps. I said Wilkerson, which happens to be Jack Preston's middle name. It should be Waterson. And the Watersons were the brothers that had the banks in Owens Valley in the 20s. They got caught by the bank examiners loading loading cash into the Model T and Lone Pine in the middle of the night to drive it up to Bishop so that the books balanced. And uh, there's one other place, Wilkerson Divide, uh, east of Crowley going on the Benton Crossing Road. Now we're done. If you want to know where we are, we're a long ways from the lake and there are a few mountains there that look very, very tiny about a quarter of the way over from center is Dunderbird. That's the easiest one to identify. And now we have, we get to the wells. This is the same location as we were just at. There's nothing there. There, uh, 45 years ago, it looked just like this, a few more sticks on the fence. I think those sticks on the fence were uh, to keep a few cattle you know, out from stomping the well to bits. I'm guessing you can't see exactly where the well is. Fingers on it, sorry. So now we've gone east of there into Great Basin Juniper, which are different than the junipers on the Sierra Nevada. There's the Great Basin Juniper of the Great Basin. The, that's the juniper that grows from the east side of Mono Lake all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And the other ones, um, yeah, I'll try, answer that, Dave. Um, anyway, must be water, the trees are so healthy and I'm kind of making a joke because they, those trees don't make take much water. Um, Alameda, I believe is a Spanish word for hungry. Dave, answer to your question. Who's got the Spanish dictionary at their fingertips? Chris does. We can answer that later. Um, we have driven 15 or 18 or 20 miles back to county ponds that are below the DeChambeau ponds that are below the DeChambeau Ranch. And these were, uh, they have not had much water in them. There's just a tiny bit. And I think this is the middle one. And you can orient yourself for the far mountains down there. Oh, it's an in view of the craters, which we don't get very much. The far mountains down there or Mount Morrison and Mount, uh, not Lyle. Conscious for all alameter is veranda. Thank you, Connie. That's a big veranda, all right. This is the furthest east of the uh, county ponds, and there's three ponds, and they're in an area about not half a mile, less than half a mile. And they pretty much straight strained together, uh, gravity fed. This is the upper pond. And there's just a sight now. There's just no water. Sorry about the fingers. So this is my pickup truck and it's parked in the ditch that runs from DeChambeau Ponds to the county ponds. And it's been dry for a very long time. This is the beginning of the DeChambeau Ponds. Uh, I believe 1911. That was the oil boom of Mono Basin, um, according to Ella Kane. And uh, they drilled 200 feet, got water at 98 degrees, and as a favor to the county, pumped it back uphill to the DeChambeau property. You can see the DeChambeau Ranch trees right over the top. This is the far end of the pipe coming out. It's about a six inch pipe. It went into this little area, it used to be a cover on it. And uh, we always called it the bathtub, but no such place. You could, you could go in there and take a spit bath with nice 100 degree water. That's the upper part of DeChambeau Ponds today. 
this was a well that was drilled by, I don't know, I'd guess that Forest Service and the Mono Lake Committee and Ducks Unlimited to pump water, subterranean water into the ponds. Nobody had money in their budgets to pay for the propane, so it wasn't used very much. That's the outgoing pipe. We're back to Google Earth. Lower left, County Park Boardwalk. And upper right, well listed. Above upper right is uh, Danburg Beach. The black hole, you cannot see the bottom of it. When the lake shore was, is lower, you can get out of the lake, salty water, and go swimming in that pond. It's absolutely crystal clear, sweet water to drink, rinse off, and you can't see the bottom. It's just the black hole. Easily seen on Google Earth. Out to Pahoa Island, um, oriented to the north, uh, south is the bottom, east is the, to the right. Um, the Black Island is to the north. The major steam vent I maintain is likely the start of the Poconip. Often, Frank can correct me on that. And there's a big steam vent there and the right in the, the center arrow was the mineral spa that started the Mono Inn really. Uh, it was a man from a title trust company from Los Angeles. In the early years, title trust companies have always made money in <laughs> California, the real estate place. And then right over the mountain, that's a mountain range down the middle of the island, right where it says mineral spa, the dark, coloring is, is the mountain range. And then the location for McPherson Ranch, which you can still see with good binoculars from the visitor center. You can see the site, uh, I don't remember exactly what, some very white looking roofs, I think. And due east, which is left from the arrow that marks McPherson Ranch was uh, the horror story for Halloween. Um, in the late 60s, maybe early 70s, a military aircraft came off a of Conway summit flying real low, swooped down towards the surface of the lake, pulled straight up, went way, way, way up, did some kind of acrobatic maneuver at high elevation, ooh, at altitude, and came straight back down and right into the lake. True or false? Terry Kellogg, who is now an officer of our uh, historical society, and uh, Tom Murphy, a lifelong friend of his, got in a boat, went out to see what they could see, and they found nothing except a helmet. And they motored over to the helmet and pulled it out of the water, and the helmet was occupied. And they let it go back in the water, and it sank down and was gone. And when the inve military investigators came to investigate the accident and they heard that Murphy and Kellogg had been out there, they went to talk to him and said, oh, we wish you'd have kept that helmet. That would have been good to have. True or false? This is the second to the last slide. Absolutely miraculous place. That's between uh, the Navy beach that the canoes are commonly launched on, which is to the right, about 200 yards, and South Tufa, which has the hundreds of tourists marching around taking photographs. This spring water is also about 98 degrees. And used to be uh, the people could bathe in it, but the forest, there is a forest note now that uh, no longer bathe in that. And the last picture absolutely fairy glen. I mean, this is to the, the that's the absolute surface of that spring, the dark spot. 
to the center, to the right. And there's water trickling down to the right. If you look closely, put your glasses on and look at the expression. You can read the man's expression on his face. And he looks like a, looks like a eight year old boy on Christmas. I mean, he's just got this smile. And there's a mystery man in the back. He's a mystery man, but there is someone that many of us know, Dave Marquardt is standing just to the right in that photograph. And that is in the files at the um, state of California, Tufa Reserve at the Forest Service Visitor Center, which is not really open to the public, but you can talk to the Mono Lake Rangers, state rangers and ask about that photo. That's it, that's the end. And if uh, Rich, if you'd dump the slideshow and uh, we can open it up to questions and I hope I can hear the questions or, um, so I just have one person on here and I've got no audio. So Randy, can you hear I me? Got, I've got audio loud and clear. Okay, now everybody, uh, if you're on Zoom right now, and if you are on a computer, you can unmute yourself by simply holding the space bar down while you talk. When you release it, you will go back on mute. So that might be a good way to ask questions. Randy, there are a number of questions in the chat line. Uh, can you see the chat at the bottom? No. Nope. Read them, read them to me, Rich. Okay, let's see. From the from the top, um, let's see. Or my, how about uh, Michael Andrews? Would you like to ask your question? I'm not getting it. Okay, Michael says uh, Mill Creek looks diverted in that photo after Lundy Canyon. Uh, no, that's way up. That's right by the powerhouse. That's right below the powerhouse. If you look in the back, you can see the you can see the out the outflow ditch or the return ditch in that photo. I, I can't go back to it, but uh, yeah, that's right across from the the new fire department. It's the multi service fire department up in Lundy Canyon, but it's not in Lower Lundy Canyon at all. So Chris Lisa asks about the Jordan powerhouse, which seems to be the topic of, of yet another full hour discussion. Um, yeah, I, I, could, Chris, I, I think I he thought, answered that. Yeah, I answered that just, it's just uh, location is just a quarter mile from the photograph of the powerhouse, um, very close to it. I, I could jump it, in if you let me. Um, 1911 was the avalanche year for the Jordan uh, power plant because there was some question about that when you were talking. So yeah, I got it wrong. Augie wasn't alive yet, but he might have told you that story. I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Next question. Uh, William Nay, can you, uh, would you like to ask or make your comment about your great grandfather? I was just commenting that Winslow Nay had, um, he and two other individuals had uh, dug a 17 mile ditch from Truckee down to Truckee Meadows uh, about 1874. And it wasn't too long after that, that he then uh, migrated south to Carson City and then on into uh, the Mono Basin. And many of you know where the Nay Ranch is. and. Uh, I've seen some lines there that I thought were probably ditches, and uh, I'm, I'm sure he brought some of that uh, knowledge of ditch digging that he did up at Truckee Meadows to the Mono Basin when he was setting up his, his ranch in the late 1890s. Thank you. Uh, Grub wants to know about uh, Warford Spring, if you have any information about it. Yeah, there's a lot of houses there. I left the houses off. <laughs> I think that's the spring that's right on uh, Pole Line Road. Or is that the one that's up high? Can someone help me? 
who's got the map. I think Warford Springs. Hey, hey Randy, Tom Peranek here. Uh, uh, Warford Springs is where John, John and Marianne Denny, Denny live now. Yes. And as I understand it, that's where the barge came in when they were hauling logs from Mono Mills on the on the scow or the barge or however they were doing it. Oh, they thank lived you for that. There, the lake was high enough, and they they kept their animals and stuff there. Yeah, there was. Um, I, I mentioned in my talk that I, I left out the private residences, uh, except the one that's show right on 395 that have a lot of traffic uh, just for privacy reasons but there's um interesting right at that location i hope you know where we're talking about the houses john and marianne denny uh cole and priscilla that are on our zoom tonight um oh, below that oh yeah old mooring so that was an addition i'm reading uh, but there was interesting one of those five homes out there which i knew when i first moved here as Green Acres uh, was a site of a whiskey still for many years. And one of them out there has a swimming pool, which I think is the only one on the basin. Anyway, next question. Uh, Charles Spiller talking about the name of a plant by Sherwin Grade. Uh, by Sherwin, Great or Conway? Charles, are you with us? Uh, I, yeah, I meant Conway. And uh, it's at the, the vegetation that indicated the water uh, there by Monoville or whatever that is. Oh, Charlie, if you go on Google Earth, man, you can zoom right in on this stuff. And if you really... Did I include the story about Wilson Creek that I missed? Oh, I didn't. Oh, I left out the back up, back up to Jordan Springs and the photograph that said Prospects Creek. I got this, this creek and I said, this is a lot of water. There's a photograph in the talk just before Jordan Springs. It's a lot of water. It's got to be on the map. I got out my big topo, the biggest one I've got, and there's no name. It's just up the canyon. It says prospects, and there's 20 or 30 prospects. And I said, oh, that's where the Goleta mine was, which I got in my research. So just tonight when I was going over the program and seeing which I'm on, yeah, yeah, well, up that is, canyon is to the left. photo, Randy? Yes, yes. Up that, that is not Prospects Creek. I named that Prospects Creek and I misnamed it. Somebody beat me to it. That is Wilson Creek. And I was totally blown away that there was a Wilson Creek and it goes up to within a mile or two of Trumbull Lake. Way, way up. And I, I always knew of Wilson Ditch slash Wilson Creek. And uh, so that's really amazing. And that was thanks to Google Earth for the, for the name of that creek. Yeah, we're, we're fine. We're just going to roll with it. Yeah, I'm reminded the hour's up by my timekeeper, but I was told by El Presidente or El Presidenta that we, uh, we're all home and comfortable and we can go to the refrigerator and get a beer. So we, we go. I don't mind if you cancel out, folks. Unplug. So so could we hear about who's coming next month, though? Because yeah, I think let, let I think that questions. speaker is actually on in the audience tonight. Um, but but and then come back. <laughs> so next month, our uh, our speaker is going to be Jennifer Roser, and uh, Jennifer or Jen owns and operates the Mill Creek Pack Station, and her presentation is going to be mm. about the history of packing in the Sierra. Mm. And mm. I just want to say. Thank you to Dave Carl for setting up the various folks to give these great talks. And, you know, as difficult as COVID has been, I think one of the pluses has been Zoom because so many people, I mean, we have 54 participants on the meeting today. And I'm sure wow. many of them aren't all here in the Mono Basin and wouldn't be able to attend these meetings without Zoom. 
And uh, so it's that's one of the great things. So thank you, first of all, Dave, for setting these up. And then um, I just think it's great that we can see these from our home. And as Randy said, go grab a beer whenever we want. <laughs> so Greg, you had uh, several questions about the ditches over there. I'm sorry. Nick, uh, Nick, are you there? So did we have any other questions? Yeah, I had one uh, for Armand when your great assortment of photos around the perimeter of the lake. Uh, you skipped over the watercourse and springs that are up Rattlesnake Canyon by the old mine uh, out through the, the granite boulder field there that's halfway down the highway from uh, Conway Summit. Yeah, uh, well, I skipped over a lot. Oh, I did even, I forgot Simon Springs and Warm Springs too, but uh, those those springs up there, I, I've never investigated and I just didn't take the time to get up there for a photograph, but maybe you can tell us about them. Yeah, I don't know much other than the fact that they flow all year round. Um, and like some of those other locations you showed, uh, there's a whole collection of uh, cottonwood trees up past the old mine uh, and below it. Um, and it's a pretty amazing uh, location. If you do any hiking out through that boulder field or in a four wheel drive vehicle uh, to get up there. And it's pretty easy to find. It's just, just above the hairpin turn there uh, as you're heading, heading up the hill on the right and, and the name is the warning rattlesnake gulch right i i will add um two of the springs simon springs and warm springs warm springs was a water stop for the railroad which that railroad grade is miles from the lake now it's interesting um and Simon Springs, there more than springs. They're, well, they're just surface water, you know. And uh, my daughter and I were out there this summer with our grandkids, uh, uh, my grandkids, her her children, and there were about twenty five to thirty horses spread along that right right along the shore of the lake, surviving on that water that at, at Lake's Edge. And uh, I suspect that they're a band from the uh, Adobe Meadows band, which is numbering a full 200 by my count two years ago, which 45 years ago, when I would keep track of those, that horse band, um, east of that juniper tree in the program, I worked for the Forest Service and uh, there was about 20. So in 40 years, they've gone from 20 to almost 300, which is interesting. The horses are doing fine in Mono County. <laughs> Some people say we should put a dog food factory out there, but that's a little, a little rude. A, a couple of people have patiently been waiting. They've raised their hands. Connie oh, Millar, do you have a question? Connie, hi. Hey, Randy, I just wanted to thank you so much. This was awesome. I learned so much. I love the Wilson oh, Creek, you. but isn't Wilson Creek? And oh, yeah, that was great. always been interested in Hector Station and that you just said there were fruit trees out there. That makes so much sense. But what I wanted to add was sort of the question that might be um, behind all of your um, discussion about water and water that has disappeared. And that is that, that this time when Euro Americans were just coming to the Mono Basin was the the actual coldest part of the Little Ice Age, which was a natural period of climate, cold climate period. It was the coldest and the wettest period in the last 10,000 years since the, the big ice ages. So the 1920s were the absolute height of when it was the coldest and wettest. So I thought it might just add a little perspective if anyone's wondering, well, why are things so dry? Is it just modern climate change. 
certainly that's part of it, but that was just um, a very, very different uh, climate history, natural climate history. And if we read the old um, Mono Basin history books when there were 26 feet of snow in the Jordan area and out here, that was, that was not an exaggeration. And I just think your um, pointing out that memory of that is really important for us to understand that history. So thank you so much, Randy. This was a great, well, you're, great- You're talk. welcome, Connie, you're welcome. I, I will add uh, about the water uh, in 1920 and uh, Jack Preston, who was born in 1900, I asked him once about how many ranches were there in the basin. He said, oh, well, little locations. I almost went into his drawl. <laughs> <laughs> he said there was there was 25 or 35 locations that were ranching was taking place but some families their kids would go out on their own and go out and dig a ditch to get water to something and then they could grow a little bit for their own spending money when there was there. but uh yeah well, it was just a lot a lot more water around and that that's obvious by the irrigation dishes that are just high and dry now Anyway, ne uh, next question, Rich, can you find a question? Well, uh, Pam Rake has uh, raised her hand. She's not on video, but if you could unmute yourself and talk to Randy. Hi, Hi everybody from Hi, Baja. Pam. I oh, sure lovely. enjoyed oh. listening. Yeah, oh. <laughs> I just wanted to say I enjoyed listening and I can't get my hand off of there. I don't know how to undo it. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, hi, <laughs> hi, hi, hi. <laughs> Hi, that hi, was hi. fun. So and, and we seem to have uh, Grub, a.k.a. Nick Carl, with his hand up. Uh, can you hear me? Gotcha. Hey, Randy, it's Nick. Uh, hi, Nick. Hey, um, great, great uh, program. It was really interesting. And I learned some things I didn't know. I just wanted to tell you that ditch that's running water towards Conway Ranch that you had a photo of, that you sound you weren't sure what was what it was. Yes, yes. What I um I've seen that called the Adair Ditch, and I've uh, A D A I R. Yes. And also, I think it's also used to be called the Lower Conway Ditch, and it's a ditch they used before the powerhouse uh, was operating to send water to Conway off mill. So I think this fall they were using it because they temporarily uh, turned the powerhouse off. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and Barche is agreeing with you. Yeah, he would know. And uh, there was an Adair, you know, uh, Charlie Adair, or was it uh, Adair was uh, Tom Peronick's grandmother's second husband. Oh, man, I'm going out on a limb. Adair is a familiar <laughs> name in the history of Mono Basin. First, first husband, Randy. First husband. <laughs> Well, I was close. I, I knew I knew they were married. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Tom. Any more questions? Yes, uh, Mike and Mary Shore have unmuted themselves. Does that mean you have a question? No, no. I, I show that we're still muted. Well, I we can, can hear, hear you. you quite well. <laughs> um, there will be a recording Oops. of this for anybody who wishes to relive these past 70 minutes, and I will send Robin a link tomorrow so you can get it from the president of the Mono Basin Historical Society. Thank you, Rich. Hey, well, if there aren't any other questions, thank you, Randy. This was yes. an awesome, awesome uh, talk. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Very good. And uh, so next month, uh, February 1st, is the first Monday of the month. We'll send out the um, information on Jem's talk a week before, and then the, um, the Zoom links the, uh, the day of, like we've been doing. So thank you all for attending, and hope we'll see 54 people next month as well. Have a good evening. Good night. Good night. Good. Thank you. Bye.